اللهم صل على فاطمة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وروح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي so dear brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah i hope inshallah everybody is doing well it's a pleasure to have you all with us again for the second night alhamdulillah this year we have the pleasure and the honor of sitting at the feet of our mother zahra and learning from her and what we learn about her is that everything about her is something which teaches us the truth and brings us to Allah. Whether it's her words or her silence, whether it's her stances, whether it's those who she took as supporters and friends, everything about her reminds us of the truth, even that hidden grave. One small story, and again, how even now she is pulling us and pushing us towards the truth. Once one of our great ulama, a man by the name of Alama Amini, he was invited to a session. It was a gathering of ulama. And the ulama were from various backgrounds, and they were all gathered to sit and to share certain ahadith. It was decided amongst them that each one would share a hadith which was confirmed by both Shia and Sunni sources. So everybody went and they would share a hadith, share a hadith, share a hadith, until it came time to the turn of Alama Amini. When it came his turn to share a hadith which was confirmed by both sources, he shared this hadith. He said, <clears throat> and the hadith is from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Ali Muhammad. He says, and he quotes the hadith, Man mata wa lam ya'rif imama zamanihi mata mitatan jahiliyya. The hadith quoted by the Prophet is this, that whoever dies and does not recognize the imam of his or her time dies the death of jahiliyya. And everybody confirmed, alhamdulillah, yes, this is a correct hadith. The Prophet did say this. this is, these are the words of the Prophet. After that, he asked a question. He said, who was the imam of Sayyidah Zahra? Who was her imam? And the audience, because it was even from the grave teaching, what's the truth, what's right? The audience went silent. How could there be an answer if you were to say that she didn't know the death or the imam of her time and she died the death of Jahiliyyah, that kofr, you could never say that. If she did have an imam and she recognized the imam, it definitely wasn't the authorities who came to her house and burned down the house. That definitely wasn't the case. The person who she recognized as an imam was none other than Amir al-Mu'mineen. And she did everything she could to support him. So again, that was a moment, even just that one hadith and the stance of Sayyidah Zahra was something that was still teaching and promoting the truth and pushing the cause forward. So inshallah, what we're going to try to do is to learn from her, from her words and her stances. And this year's lecture series has been titled, The Power of Wilaya." Right? A guide through Fatima's eyes. And we're taking inspiration from one of the many beautiful verses of the Quran which address wilaya, Quranic wilaya, the true wilaya that we must all have. And it's this verse. It's Surah 5 and it's verse number 55. 
Well, Allah says this in Surah Ma'idah, verse number 55, 56, sorry, 556. Allah says this in the Quran. وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ Allah, And whoever embraces the wilaya of God, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولَ And his messenger, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And those who believe, فَإِنَّ حِزْبَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْغَالِبُونَ Truly, the party of God, they are victorious. They're invincible. And that's important for us because you and I, we're preparing for a living imam. The last imam. But the thing about the last imam is that he won't reappear and then be madloom. Or then lose. Or then be defeated. He will not reappear unless he's going to be victorious. That means that we as the followers have work to do because the Imam will not reappear unless he's victorious. That means we have to adopt, embrace that Quranic wilaya. And not only that, we also have a responsibility to share and to teach and to talk to others about Quranic wilaya. So it reminded me when we are starting off on this premise, we're marching towards victory. That's why we're talking about the power of wilaya. That are, that's why we're trying to get these lessons from Sayyid al-Zahra. They reminded me recently about what Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah said when he spoke, when he finally addressed the global community about the situation in Gaza. And he said that there is no way that this ends except that the resistance will be victorious. That's the only way this ends. We're not, we're in the time now of victories. Victories after victories, inshallah, until we are able to pave the way for the coming of the Imam. So, one point, and I just wanted to do this yesterday, I forgot, brothers and sisters, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for protesting, for speaking out, for being on the side of truth, for sharing messages, your contribution and the contribution of the ummah and the contribution of the people of conscience made a difference. We are all partners in that victory. The main heavy lifting was done by our brothers and sisters in Gaza, both the resistance and then those families who didn't say uncle, who didn't croak, who didn't bend, who didn't bow, but then also the believers who are on the outside were applying that pressure. And you remember from that speech of the Sayyid where he says that the protest in America and Europe were more important than the protest in the Arab world, for instance, and the rest of the Muslim community. So I wanted to thank you all, appreciate you all for that, and to warn our enemies of the Quranic promise. If they do revert back to their old ways, then we will be out there. We will be back in the streets. We will continue to protest. As Allah says in the Quran, this is surah number 17. and verse number 8, Allah says to them, وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا You go back to those devious ways, we will right there with you. We can do this all day. We will be doing this until we experience, inshallah, that victory. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There's one more thing that I want to say. It's something that the leader spoke about a while back. A while back, he gave us one of those key sentences. I hope we're all paying attention to the words of the leader, the words he's sharing right now, the words he said in the past. Several years ago, this might have been 17 years ago, the leader said something. He said that there is a mysterious and secret relationship role that Palestine plays in the delivery for the Ummah. Brothers and sisters, Palestine is the litmus test. Right now, you and I are working to be soldiers of the last Imam, the 12th Imam. The 12th Imam is coming to Fill the, world with, fill the world with justice, just as it's been filled with injustice. 
it would be impossible for us as Shia to claim that we are soldiers of that living Imam without adopting the stances of our living Imam. Our stances, we learn from Imam Hussein, Mithli la yubayu mithla. Someone like me, someone like Hussein, won't make bay'ah to Yazid, and those who are like him won't make bay'ah to those who are like that Yazid. So, we're soldiers of the Imam, and we're waiting for the Imam who's going to fill the world with justice. Would it be possible, question now, would it be possible for us as believers to watch the most terrible form of loom on earth happen and be indifferent and still be soldiers of the Imam? You know, the Zionists, this is a war on children. The Zionist regime will take a child who is throwing a rock and put that child in prison for 20 years. That's not them. They harvest the skin of dead Palestinians. Like, we're talking about a deep, dark, evil, racist ideology. The worst kind of loom on the earth. Would it be possible for me as a follower of the Imam to not have a stance when it comes to this atrocity and still say I'm waiting for the Imam? So no. We, if they continue, we continue. There's only way that, one way this ends, and that's victory, but it's the litmus test. What is our stance? It can't happen on our watch. So, now, brothers and sisters, salawat, please. We arrived at some important conclusions last time. So, yesterday's speech... We arrived at some conclusions. And again, I'm expecting that brothers and sisters are reading the book, right? So yesterday they would have, for instance, read the chapter on the introduction to Wilaya. And then today, the relations of the Ummah were kind of reading. And then the points that I add are supplemental points, as opposed to I'm reiterating verbatim whatever is there in the book. We're learning together because this is the right way to learn Islam and then share Islam. So we arrived at some points yesterday from the combination of our readings and what was shared in the lecture before. Number one, because we're collectively going over the ayat of the Quran together. If you've noticed, I'm going to pause. I'm going to share the verses. Brothers and sisters, we'll look at the verses. We're going to see this together, and then we learn something, and we take something away from this. Number one, point number one. The method laid out in this book is the right way for you and I to teach Islam to the masses. So we have a responsibility, the clarification jihad. That means that you and I, in smaller circles, we have conversations with people. We talk to people. We have a lot of compassion in our hearts. We know that people are misinformed. That's up to us now to share these truths, to speak to people. So. We're talking to other Muslims, other Shias, who still have not been able to connect the dots. We're talking to our Sunni brothers and sisters. We're talking to non-Muslims and the people of conscience. The right way to introduce people to Islam, the Quranic Aqidah is what we're studying in the book, right? So for instance, one of the things that people need to know, and I want you to compare this with how we've been taught Islam and what you see from good people. People are Muslims. They're Muslims, they're practicing, they're praying. But the aqidah is not the Quranic aqidah. I haven't been taught in that way. My moral compass hasn't been aligned with the Quran. So sometimes I can make mistakes that from a Quranic point of view are not acceptable. But I need somebody to care enough about me to sit down with me and have a conversation with me and talk me through this and explain to me. One example. We learned this from the book before. That Quranic Iman, because all of us now have a job in smaller circles. We're all talking to others. We're all sharing these truths. We learned before that Quranic Iman, faith, 
It had three conditions. One of the conditions of Quranic Iman is that I can't pick and choose with Islam. Now, because we covered this before, I'm not going to go back over it. I'm going to give you guys one part of the verse. We're going to look at one, one part of a verse very quickly. Guys, can you look, can you turn to Surah 24 and verse number 47? Does anybody tell me if you have that verse? So Surah 24 and verse number 47. Do you guys see the last part of that verse? Do you see the part that I'm going to refer to? And if not, does it, first of all, did anybody have it? Okay. Do you guys look at the last part of that verse? Let's see if I'm quoting this correctly. Do you see where Allah says, وَمَا أُولَٰئِكَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ Anybody see that? Okay. So if you guys remember from before, we covered this verse in detail. What we learned from the Quran was that if somebody picks and chooses, when Islam is in my favor, then I rush and I'm saying, yes, Allah spoke. But then when Islam is not in my favor, then I back out. The Quran is clear. Those are not mu'mineen, not according to Quran. People don't know this. It's not that people are evil. They don't. What is the Quran? If I don't do, if I pick and choose, the Quran says, this conversation to have. You have to explain to people. The Quran also said something else. If I'm picking, and the other, by the way, there's another assumption. What we're assuming is that people don't know. People love God. They love his book. They love Islam. They love the Quran. They don't know the conversations, right? So we're not assuming anything, writing on cloud nine. We're not assuming, people don't know. Ayat of the Quran. The next thing we learned from that same story in the same chapter was this. If, once Allah has spoken, Allah has spoken, and I know better now. If I'm still picking and choosing, then the Quran says, I'm mean and a bully. The word in the ayat of the Quran next, if you remember those verses, the Quran said these people are dhalim. People need to know this. So, summarizing the first point, the right way to teach Islam was the Quranic method of teaching the aqidah. So people, everyone knows from the beginning what Islam says. But Islam says we can end this cycle of misery when people know what Islam says. By the way, this isn't a Shia or Sunni approach. The Quran. Anybody who's a student of the Quran, they look at the Quran. So that was one. Number two, we learn that wilaya is the next logical step for nubuwa. Quranic wilaya. Now remember, we're, we're, we're going to operate based on that first point. As a Muslim, I have to accept all of Islam. I can't accept part of the ayat of the Quran. Quranic wilaya is spoken about in the Quran. I can't pick and choose with Islam. The next logical step after nubuwa is wilaya. For anybody. Any student of Islam, the next step after I've embraced Nubuwa is to embrace Wilaya. We talked a little bit about it last time. We talked about it as a survival mechanism. I want to share one of the verses of the Quran with you. If you guys can turn with me to a verse of Quran and then just a little bit of what we learned, then we're going to move on. So brothers and sisters, let's see if this next verse of Quran I've quoted correctly. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 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 Guys, can you turn to surah number 8? So surah number 8 and verse number 62. Do you guys see this? First of all, does anybody see it? Surah 8 and verse number 62. Anybody have that yet? Okay. Do you guys see this? Let's see if I quoted it correctly. Does anybody see that? No? Yes? Wait, let's, some people are saying there's only one, one version of the Quran. So maybe it's the wrong ayat. Is it 62, 862? Okay. Do you guys see huwalladhi ayyadaka? Okay. So let's read that verse of Quran together. Remember what we're talking about. We said that this is the logical next step for nubuwa. We're going back to what we learned yesterday. Yesterday we said this. When a prophet comes to take humanity to make them experience God's best in this world, he creates divine societies, a system. 
the prophet assumes political rule. He establishes a divine society. We covered that in the discussion on Nabuwa. All prophets do this. All imams do this. This is the blueprint. Imam Mahdi is going to do this. We're doing the heavy lifting now. So part of that was a question. Does the, how does the prophet do that? Does he just go and meet with everybody individually? Does he go over and develop a group of students? What does he do? He said he has to develop that divine system. But then we asked another question. Well, didn't the prophet need human beings to help him? We said, yes. How does he do it then? The prophet has to start with that first group of mu'mineen who are going to carry the mission forward. He has to talk with them, meet with them, train them, invite them to God. Those are going to form the human pillars for him to do that great work. So now let's look again at the ayat of Quran, and then we'll move on. So let's look again at this verse of Quran. So, brothers and sisters, the same verse, Surah 8, verse number 62, God's describing himself. He says this, Huwaladhi, he is the one, ayyadaka, God provided you with assistance, ta'yid, he strengthened you. How did he do that? How did God do that? Binasrihi, one of the ways was the divine assistance, wabil mu'mineen, and with the believers. So a prophet, when he's starting his mission, in order to begin his mission, he needs mu'mineen. Those mu'mineen are going to form those human pillars for later. The prophet talks to them, convinces them, explains to them, and they form that first nucleus. Then after that, we said there's another use for wilaya later when it comes to the unity of the ummah. Right now, we talked about it as a survival me mechanism to make sure that believers didn't get lost and didn't assimilate into the society, which is now based on jahiliyyah. So that was one thing that we learned. Number three, we also learned that no, without wilaya, nubuwa is incomplete. We can't have nubuwa and then not have wilaya. The mission will fail. Right? One verse of Quran about that. So brothers and sisters, if you can turn with me to surah number five and verse number 67. We're going to see again that this is a Quranic take when God introduces the concept of wilaya. How important is it? Ayat of Quran. Let's see if anybody can find Surah 5 and verse number 67. Does anybody have it? Okay. Let's see. Do you guys see the same thing? Just let's see I'm quoting it correctly. Ya ayyuhar rasul. No? Yes? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Make sure I have the right copy of the Quran here. Okay. So let's look at the verse together. Ya ayyuhar rasul. O messenger. God speaking to the prophet. O messenger. Ballig ma unzila ilayk mir rabbik. You deliver that message that's been revealed to you from your Lord. What if I don't deliver that message of wilaya? Nubuwa without wilaya. Allah says, wa in lam tafal. If you do not do this, fama balagta risalata. You have not delivered the message. Islam is not complete without wilaya. So we learned that also. Now, we're going to start with a new lesson, and we're going to be able to cover. So let me just give you a big picture thing of where we're going. Quranic wilaya has three dimensions. Quranic wilaya, as taught by God, has three dimensions. We're going to talk about, inshallah, two of those dimensions tonight. The third one we'll leave for tomorrow, inshallah, when we wrap up the lecture series. So the first kind of wilaya that must exist, because we said wilaya, as we defined it yesterday, was that bond between believers. We started off as a resistance community, let's say in the time of Mecca, trying to preserve that wilaya between the believers. What happens is the first part of wilaya is horizontal wilaya. Right? Wilaya amongst all of us as believers, as mu'minin and mu'minat. One verse of the Quran Let's look at one verse of the Quran. Let's see if you guys can find number, uh, surah number 9 and verse number 71. So 971. One of the dimensions of wilaya is the relationship between the believers, that inseparable bond that unites us and it makes us be able to resist. So you guys, do you see this? So 971. Do you see wal mu'minuna wal mu'minat? Yes? Okay. 
So let's look at this verse again together. Wal mu'minuna wal mu'minat. So believing men and believing women, ba'dhuhum awliya'u ba'dh. They have wilaya over one another. They are wali of one another. There's a horizontal wilaya that exists amongst the believers, Quranic wilaya, that inseparable bond. I gave the example yesterday of the mountain climbers, right? The idea that we care for one another, we're looking out for one another, we're protecting one another. Now a couple of hadith about this, and after that we're going to see an example of this from the teachings of our mother, Sayyida Fatima. So, again we're talking about that individual, that relationship between us. This is from our prophet, and he says this, مَثَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي تَوَادِّهِمْ وَتَرَاحُمِهِمْ The simile of the believers in their love for one another and the mercy that they show one another, he says, كَمَثَلِ jasad. It's just like one body. I can't, as a believer, sleep calmly at night and know that the Palestinians are being massacred. And just go about my day and talk comfortably. No, no, I, I'm upset. Like the, all of us, and the Prophet gave such a wonderful example. When one part of our body is sick, right? If we have a toothache as an example, right? The rest of the body is suffering, right? As a believer, the, the emotional relationship is so strong, like one body. One example from our mother, Sayyida Fatima, because she's the best teacher. So this is a story from her son, Imam Hassan. So he says this. He was young at this time. He's learning from his mother how to have Quranic wilaya. How important is it to care about other people, other believers? So he says that one night when my mother was offering Salatul Layl, I stayed awake and I listened. She's praying all night, I'm listening. He says this, he says, I heard her so Imam Hassan now speaking. I was listening to her as she was praying for the believers, the mu'mineen and mu'minat. What to him? Our mother was praying for the believers by name. Not just saying Allahumma ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. Mentioning believers by name, such and such. Inshallah Allah help them, such and such Allah help, right? Mentioning them, our mother over there praying. And the Imam said he was there listening. He said, What took thiru dua? She wouldn't just say one trite prayer that, you know, Allah bless them. No, no. Praying for them. Inshallah, Allah help them. Allah did, right? And so she's, he's listening to all of this. He said, But I noticed something. She didn't make any dua for herself. Praying the whole night, he's listening, not making any dua for. So then he said, I asked my mother, I said, Well, why didn't you make some du'as for yourself? And that's when she saw it was a teachable moment. A way to remind Imam Hassan that the Ahlul Bayt are different from any other family. She said the hadith, Ya Bunay. So she addressed her son. She said, Al Jar Thummadar. First we pray for the neighbors, then after that we pray for our own house. Right? So the epitome of caring for others, loving others, looking out for others, right? Is the, our, the epitome is our mother. I'm not saying it's haram for us to make dua for ourselves, right? We're learning from her. We're moving in that direction where she cares that much about each and every one of us. Dua by me. So, I want to give now just a little bit of a, like, move off this one second so we can learn a practical lesson. How do we know, you and I, how do we know if our wilaya, that first level of wilaya, the horizontal wilaya, is my personal wilaya, is that trending in the right direction? Is there a tangible sign, something that I could look and examine myself and see that the first level of wilaya, wilaya amongst believers, is there a way for me to know that the wilaya that I'm supposed to have, Quran is teaching me, is trending in the right direction? The answer is yes. There's an easy sign. How much do you and I care for other believers? How much do you love your brothers and sisters? The more you do, the more your wilaya is trending in the right direction. I want to share a hadith to you that the orafa would recite for their students. The orafa. So imagine... I call it the principle of the sinner and the saint. 
the sinner and the saint. We're learning about practical will I. We're looking for that, practi- that, that lesson on how I can see if my will I is trending in the right way. The principle of the sinner and the saint. Some of us are less than perfect mu'minin. And some of us, at least we would think that we're moving in the right direction, we're doing the right things, right? So imagine for this example that you have Ayatollah Behjat as an example. Ayatollah Behjat, may Allah have mercy on his soul, may he raise him with the Anbiya. And then you have a regular mu'min like me. Sinner versus saint. Now listen to the hadith of the Imam. The Imam says this, Inna al-mu'minayn, truly, two of the mu'minayn, Inna al-mu'minayn, two of the mu'minayn, Ida iltaqata, if two believers meet each other, fatasafaha, these believers shake hands with one another. He says, Adhalallah yadahu bayna yadihima. God puts his hand between their hands. So two of the believers meet each other. Alhamdulillah, they shake hands with one another. God puts his hand between the hands of the two believers. But then something strange happens. The tangible sign, wilaya. Do I have it? Is it trending in the right direction? God turns with his countenance to the believer who loves the other believer more. How do I know if my wilaya is tra- trending in the right direction? So the Urafa would tell this to their students. I'm an outwardly practicing believer. Let's say somebody like Ayatollah Basha, he sees me and all of my issues and problems. They would warn them. Would it be the case that Ayatollah Basha would look at somebody like me, you're a sinner, you're bad, ghib, all these problems? And maybe I, as the sinner, would look towards the Ayatollah Basha and be like, he's just so close to God, close to Ayatollah Bayt. Would I love him more? The idea would be for the Ayatollah Basha, at that level, to love me more than I loved him. The sinner and the saint. So how do we know? Just wrap up this first point. If I meet another believer, a mu'min or mu'mina, and I love them more than they love me, I care about them, right? That would be the sign that I'm moving in the right direction for that wilaya. Now, salawat please. What about if we don't live in a perfect world, though? Sometimes the people where I'm interacting with are mu'minin, but sometimes they're not perfect mu'minin and mu'minat. Sometimes they might even have an issue with one another. And I'll be called in as a mu'min to mediate, as an example. I want to give you a Quranic example, again, how this wilaya works. So this one, brothers and sisters, can you turn to Surah 49? Surah 49 and verse number 9. We're going to learn another Islamic principle. Let's say there are two of the believers, and for whatever reason, they have a dispute on an issue. How do I, as a believer who loves them, how am I supposed to respond? So let's see. Guys, do you see 49.9? Do you see? Okay. So let's read this together. If you have two groups of believers... And these guys are going at it with one another. They're fighting. They're at war with one another. They have serious issues. The believers do not, but they don't agree with one another. What is your first responsibility? The Quran says, If you can, you try to fix things between these believers. You try to calm people down. You talk them off the ledge. You explain to them, this person cares about you. You try. But, what about if one person thinks they're above the law? They won't back down. In this case, the Quran has another very clear reminder. The Quran says, فَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى If one of them won't back down, they want to bully the other mu'min. This is, I'm not going to submit to what God says. At this stage, it's the responsibility of the believers. فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي you go after the person who won't back down and won't submit to Allah. Hatta tafia ila amrillah. You apply that social pressure on the other person until they back down and they agree and accept what Allah says. So this is another one. 
As a believer, this might happen just in our own personal lives. Sometimes you're invited to mediate between people. Mediate between people. And there's a standard way people do, do it, right? They try to get people to back off of their rights, as an example. But in the case where one person is not backing down and won't submit to Allah, actually my job is to make that person back down, not to mediate. I have to tell that person that's not right. Once somebody came, this was in the time of the PLO. So Imam Khomeini obviously took a strong stance with Palestine. And they wanted to resolve it in the normal way. So they wanted to send some mediators to go between Imam Khomeini and the others to talk Imam Khomeini down, just back off, leave Palestine alone, the same way it's normally done. And Imam Khomeini refused to see the mediators. So in this interview, it's in Time magazine. Then they asked Imam Khomeini, they said, well, normally, when there's an issue between people, we send mediators, mediators talk to people. And Imam Khomeini explained a principle. He said that when one side's a dhalim and the other is a madhloom, you don't mediate between the two of them. You go against the dhalim and you make the dhalim back down. It's a crime to be on the side, I'm going to just, let's just calm things down. No, no. Peace and justice. Right? So from the Quran point of view, that will be another thing that we want to keep in mind when it comes to that thing. Now, our mother, Sayyidah Fatima, also, she was, she would teach lessons the right way. She's a mother, but she would teach lessons the right way. Once, just one story from her about this, that once a man wanted to find out if he was one of the Shia or not. So he asked his wife, he said, can you pass a message to Sayyidah Fatima? I want to know. I want to hear from her. He said that, am I one of the Shia? So his wife went, she spoke to Sayyidah Fatima. So she said very clearly, she said, if you do the things we command you to, then you're one of the Shia. If you don't, you're not. She didn't mince words. She was clear. She explained, right? She told the truth. Right? And as a believer, even when I'm dealing with other believers, I stand on the side of truth. Now, there's another one that we need to talk about, too. Right? And that's not accepting the wilaya of the enemies of Allah. That's step number two. Now, with that one, we also need to make sure that we're doing that the right way. We understand what it is. Um, but before that, is it okay if I tell you guys a story that's not true, inshallah? Okay. It's not true, inshallah. Once there was a family, and this family, unfortunately, they didn't enjoy wilaya, in the way that I explained with the ayat of the Quran. It's not true, though, inshallah. Okay. The guy's name is Bob. Okay. So Bob was a very smart guy, one of the smartest guys alive. They say Bob had five degrees, but Bob had messed up, and he forgot his wife's, he forgot his anniversary. And his wife was very angry. And she told Bob, she said, I want a present. It better go from zero to 206 seconds, and it better be there tomorrow. Bob left for work. When his wife woke up the next day, she looked out in the driveway and she saw there was a present. It was a box. It was wrapped. It was sitting there in the driveway. So Bob's wife ran out and she went over and got the box and took it inside and she opened the box. You know what it was? It was a bathroom scale. <laughs> you see, the sad thing, though, is that Bob, he, didn't, he hadn't been seen since Friday. You know, no word of Bob. It's not a lot of what I over there. So we don't want to be like that. Quranic, so loving amongst one another, kind, gentle, these things. Now to the next point. Wilaya outside, or not having the wilaya of the kuffar. Not having wilaya of the enemies of Allah. This is another one that's spoken a lot in the Quran. A lot of verses in the Quran. I'm going to mention one of them. Our brother mentioned it when he was reciting the ayat of the Quran. So brothers and sisters, can you turn with me to one of the verses of the Quran? Surah 5 and verse number 51. 551. Guys, do you see this? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. 
551, anybody see it, first of all? Yes? Okay. Let's read this one together. So what are we talking about? One other dimension of wilaya, which is not accepting the wilaya of the enemies of Allah. So, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, la tattakhidhu al-yahud wa nasara awliya. Do not take the Jews and the Christians as awliya. Ba'dhuhum awliya o ba'dh. Some of them have wilaya over one another. What happens if I do take them as awliya? وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُمْ مِنْكُمْ And if one of you takes them and embraces their wilaya, فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ Then this person is one of them. إِنَّ اللَّهُ Truly Allah لَا يَهْتِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Truly Allah does not guide the zalimin, the unjust people. So, with this one also, it's important for us to keep in mind. This, the details are explained in the book. In the book, he explained that there's a difference between you and I, our neighbors. Your average Joe, walking down the street, somebody you're interacting with at work. Right? It's not that the believers don't have the ayat of the Quran talk about how we'll deal with regular people. But when it comes to the enemy, the bad guys, being under the authority of those guys, then Islam has a clear red line. In the book, he explains something more than that. They're not supposed to, so he explains. It doesn't mean as believers, we're isolated from the rest of the world. That's not the message of the Quran. Rather, we're interacting, but we're interacting with strength. The believers are not supposed to be even affected by the culture of those who are not believers in Allah. The supremacy of Islam is to be preserved. It's not monkey see, monkey do. I want to be, no, no. The Quran is very clear. The hadith are very clear. Al-Islamu ya'lu. Islam is supreme. Wala yu'la alayh. And nothing is supreme to Islam. So the believers, when it comes, we're going to learn, inshallah, from Sayyid of Atima, and then after that we'll go to the Masai. When it comes to, so the other dimension of wilaya was this. I do not have the wilaya of the enemies of God. I don't, I'm not connected with them. My camp is the camp of the believers. With them, it is love, it's mercy, ruhama bainahum, kindness, gentleness, overlooking mistakes. When it comes with the, to the enemy, then it's stern. Ashidda ala al-kufar. Right, with many verses of the Quran about this. It doesn't mean as a believer that I'm completely isolated. No, I'm interacting. But when I'm interacting, I'm interacting with a, from a point of view of strength. When it comes to the enemies of Islam, hadith now from the Prophet, he says this about us. He says, وَهُمْ يَدٌ عَلَى مَنْ سِوَاهُمْ The believers are one hand when it comes to those who are opposed to them. So that's the, the other dimension. Now we know a little, a little bit about our mother, Sayyidah Fatima, and then after that we'll go to the... Masai. So for our mother, Sayyida Fatima, remember when this whole story takes place, the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen is taken away. And our mother is pregnant. She's pregnant. When it came to rejecting the wilaya of the authorities, our mother Fatima didn't hesitate. She didn't stammer. She didn't say, wait till, let me at least deliver. Let's keep things calm. Rather, and we've covered this in detail before, when it comes to that kind of jihad, you see the fiery khutbas of our mother. You see her going door to door, gathering muhajirin and ansar. You see the political sit-in at her house. Right? You're seeing all these practical steps. More than that. How much do you think our mother loved Muhsin? After all, the prophet had named him. What you see from our mother is that she sacrificed her reputation. In the khutbah of Fadak, that she spoke to the people after she did all of that speaking, then she told the people, she says, Ya ayyuhan nas, i'lamu anni Fatima wa abi Muhammad. People know this, I'm Fatima. My father is Muhammad. She put her reputation on the line. 
She put her energy on the line. She put her life on the line. She put her body on the line. She put her baby on the line. That was how she rejected the wilaya of those who were opposed to the wilaya of God. We end with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Fatimata wa abiyya. وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها بعدد ما أحاط به الموك all together Allahumma kul valiyak Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan Salawatuka alay Wa ala في كل يا ابن الحسن يا ابن الحسن يا ابن السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء يا بنت محمد يا غرة عين الرسول يا سيدتنا ومولاتنا إنا توجهنا واستجفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي راجاتنا يا وجيهة عند الله All together اشفعي لنا 
يا وجيه اشفعينا نار Oh Allah, we don't know whether we will get to see another Fatimiyya. Maybe this is our last Fatimiyya. Oh Allah, as long as we are alive, don't separate us from this holy household. We don't have anywhere to go other than the door of this family. Tonight is the second night, the night before Lady Fatima departs from this world. Let's take our hearts to Medina. At this time, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were still little children. Now just imagine how the children are feeling. They see their mother having a hard time getting up from bed. They see their mother in pain. Maybe they know it's the final days. Maybe they still have hope that their mother will become better. It is said that on the final days, the woman of Medina came to visit Lady Fatima. When the women wanted to leave, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein were standing next to the door. As the women are leaving, they say to one another, The condition of Fatima that we see, she won't last any more than a couple of days. How must you have felt, Ya Imam Hassan, Ya Imam Hussain, Ya Imam Hassan, Ya Imam Hussain. The narration says on the final days, Amir al Mu'minin made his way home from the masjid. After praying Salat al duh as he is reaching his home, the ladies of the neighborhood approach him. He sees them weeping with extreme sadness. فَقَالَ لِهُنَّ مَا الْخَبَرُ وَمَا لِي أَرَاكُنَّ مُتَغَيِّرَاتِ الْوُجُوهِ وَالصُّوَرِ he says to them, what has happened? Why are you all acting like this? فَقُلْنَ يَا أَمِيرَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَدْرِكْ إِبْنَةَ عَمِّكَ الزَّهْرَى وَمَا نَذُنُّكَ تَدْرِكُهَا They said, O oh, commander of the faithful, Hurry towards seeing Lady Zahra. We don't think you will see her much longer. فأقبل أمير المؤمنين مصرعا حتى دخل عليها أمير المؤمنين began moving quickly until he entered the house وإذا بها ملقا على فراشا He sees Lady Fatima as she is laying down what else does he see? وَهِيَ تَغْبِضُ يَمِينًا وَتَمُدُّ شِمَالًا Lady Fatima was twisting and turning left and right from the bed. فَأَلْقَى الرَّدَاءَ أَنْ أَعْتَقَى وَالْأَمَامَةَ أَنْ رَأَسِهِ He threw his cloak from his shoulders he threw his turban to the ground. وَأَقْبَلَ حَتَّى أَخَذَ رَأْسَهَا وَتَرَكَهُ فِي هِجْرِهِ He came closer until he held the head of Lady Fatima in his lap. وَنَادَاهَا يَا زَهْرَا 
فلم تکلمه He called out Ya Zahra But she did not respond to him فَنَادَهَا يَا بِنْتَ مُحَمَّدِ الْمُصْطَفَى فَلَمْ تُكَلِّمُهُ He called out again, O daughter of the Prophet No matter how he called her, she didn't respond So finally he called out فَنَادَهَا يَا فَاطِمَا كَلَّمِينِي فأنا ابن عمك علي ابن أبي طالب أو فاطمة speak to me for I am your علي for I am your علي for I am your علي The narration says فَفَتَحَتْ عَيْنَيَا فِي وَجْهِ وَنَذَرَتْ إِلَيْهِ The narration says she opened her eyes She looked at the face of Amir al-Mu'mineen وَبَكَتْ وَبَكُوا Both of them began crying يَا أمير al-Mu'mineen What happened to your heart when you saw your beloved Zahra like this? Ya Zahra Ya Zahra Ya Zahra On the final night Lady Fatima had become bedridden. She wasn't able to get up from her place of sleep. Some narrations say the lady wasn't even able to move side to side. I don't know how and with what strength, but it is said that on a night like this, Lady Fatima rose from her bed. She began taking care of the home. She bathed the children. She changed their clothes. She began tending to the household. When Amir al-Mu'mineen entered, when Amir al-Mu'mineen entered the house, he said to her, O oh daughter of Rasulullah, Alhamdulillah, are you feeling better? She replied, No, O oh, Amir al muminin I'm doing my final duty. I'm preparing to depart from this world. I heard my father say to me, Tomorrow you will join us. Imagine the pain in the heart of Amir al muminin The pain in the heart of the children. But the sorrows didn't end there. It became even more difficult. Lady Fatima says to Imam Ali, My dear Ali, come sit by my bed. I want to tell you my will. She began giving her wasiyah. Then she said, Oh Ali, Are you ready to hear my will regarding my burial? Ya bin Rasul Allah, I am ready. Whatever it is, I will carry it out for you. In that case, O oh Ali, غسل لي بالله كفني بالله دفني بالله bury me at night do everything at night ولا تعلم به أحدا don't inform anyone of my burial يا فاطمة الزهراء يا زهراء يا زهراء يا 
زهرا صلى الله عليك يا فاطمة الزهرا يا بنت محمد يا غرة عين الرسول يا سيدتنا ومولاتنا إن توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك بين يدي حاجاتنا all together يا وجيهتان عند الله اشفعي لنا عند الله يا وجيهتان اشفعي لنا عند الله اشفعي لنا عند